All right. Hopefully, Anna can begin. We are plugging away to the CAD uh, lab. All right, lab today. Uh, we do have presentations. So, those of you that are presenting, make sure you, you get it to me uh, before lab, and I'll uh, open them up on the computer. Uh, we're going to be looking at quite a few nematodes. Um, Quite a few, quite a few nematodes in the lab because it, it's, we basically have two weeks. Uh, so nematodes, hopefully get through most of them this week and the next week is should be review of nematodes and the acanthocephalus. All right. <clears throat> so what are we were talking about the mer uh, mermithidae, mermithid parasites. All right, so these are, we started our nematode talk with, or the diversity, uh, with focusing on those nematodes that utilize insect hosts. Now this isn't, these are those that utilize the insects. They're required, not as like an intermediate host, but as a definitive host. Uh, or in the case of, of some of these guys where it's, it grows and develops inside of that host and then the adult comes out and, and drops the eggs. So we broke this up into three different life cycles. So we had an aquatic life cycle where we talked about Romanomeris, and then we've got these two different life cycle, the terrestrial life cycle patterns. So this is, we, we, we did the Skeeter Doom uh, Romanomeris cubiciborax, and now the second terrestrial life cycle, that will, or the, the first pattern is Mermis nigrescens. All right, so Mermis nigrescens, is a parasite of grasshoppers. All right, parasite of grasshoppers. With this parasite, the adult females are going to emerge from the soil, climb up plants, and then deposit eggs. Now the eggs have an interesting adaptation. All right, the eggs have these threads called bissy. B-Y-S-S-I, right? These are going to be branched filaments on the eggs. It's these structures that will basically stick to the plants. So like as it starts to dry out, you're going to have these threads basically getting locked onto those plants, and it keeps the eggs up there so that when an insect, when a grasshopper comes along and feeds on the plant, it increases the chance that they're actually going to be consuming them. Now, I'm going to put up the life cycle here in a bit, but what I want to point out is that in this terrestrial life cycle, the movement of our females up those plants is initiated by water. All right, so they're going to be hanging out in the soil, and as soon as water percolates down to them, they're going to sense the liquid water. That's, that's going to trigger them to move up to the soil and try to climb up these, uh, this vegetation. All right, so Mermis nigrescens. Let's go through our life cycle. Oh, I can't enlarge this. And just, just the cameras. Mermis nigrescens. All right, so our adults are going to be in the soil. They're going to be in the soil. While they're in the soil, the eggs are going to be retained in the uterus. So unlike our platyhelminthes, when the eggs develop, they, they end up getting shot out of the, the uterine pore, or let's say the tapeworms, these proglottids will get released and then they rupture, release the eggs and so forth. Not with these guys. We're going to have the eggs, they're going to be retained in the uterus until there's rainfall. And that gets our water in the soil. All right, so rain's going to come in and it can't just be a drizzle. You're going to have to have some, some 
decent sized rain so that the water will percolate down. Now, how deep are these guys? Maybe 10 to 20 centimeters at best. All right, maybe shallower, uh, may, maybe slightly deeper. All right, but they're gonna get triggered by the rain. And then, once they emerge from the soil, they're gonna be positively phototactic. Because we're gonna have our adult females that will be migrating up onto that vegetation. Doesn't really need the males, right? because the eggs are already inside the female. So in terms of our adaptation, our adult females are gonna be this positively phototactic. So they're gonna constantly try to move towards the light. That's kind of prompts the climbing behavior. Right? So they're gonna be on the vegetation. These females are gonna deposit the eggs. That's going to be on our vegetation. Right, and again, they're going to be sticking with these visci uh, that are on those eggs. Right, and then the eggs are going to be consumed by our host. Right, and they're going to be consumed by our grasshopper. Now it's grasshopper. This one, nigrescens, is grasshoppers. Uh, other ones could be katydids, uh, other species. So again, we do have some specificity. Now inside of the grasshoppers, our eggs are going to hatch, and we're going to ultimately develop two J3s. So we're in our grasshoppers. We de develop two J3s. And then this is where the life cycle just kind of becomes questionable on my part, all right? So I've done a lot of searching, looking for what are these next stages? Because all that they talk about is larval stage, juvenile stage, they don't give numbers. So what we do know, at least from the publications that talk about the life cycles, we have a juvenile stage that leaves the grasshopper, all right? We're going to have rupture of that host and escape of our juvenile stage. Now, if we're going to rupture that host, what do you think happens to that host? Yeah. It, it dies. All right? So now, I'm going to presume that this is our J3. And that, I'm going to add the question mark there. I'm going to presume it's a J3. Because we know, at least from, from publications, we get to at least J2, probably J3s inside that host. Once we escape from that gra grasshopper, then we're going to have movement where these things migrate into the soil. All right? Migrate into the soil. Now, how do they do that? Well, it's because these larval stages are actually negatively phototactic. Right, so our adults were positively phototactic. Right? Now our juveniles are negatively phototactic. So we've got movement into the soil. And then, this is again, just a presumption, once we get into the soil, I'm going to assume we have this J3 to J4. Right. Okay. Seriously, move this? Did anyone see me move this? Did I carry it with me? I thought I left it. I thought I left it sitting there. Maybe I did. I don't know. But anyways, I'm going to presume that we have, if this is the J3 stage, our J, uh, we're going to have to have a molting event to get to that J4. All right, and then once we get to that J4, we do know, or at least based on you know, the life cycles, or the reports of it, our, our larval stage molts to the adult stage. So our references basically say developing or juvenile stages. They don't give numbers. Uh, and I suspect the reason why is they're not, they're not overly studied. So there's not a huge interest in them. Because why? They go into grasshoppers. Do they affect us? Not a whole lot. 
right? So questions. So on this, this terrestrial life cycle pattern, waters are signal, causes the adults to migrate up the plains. Our second pattern, which we don't have this one, is that our eggs, they're not, no longer retained in the uterus. The eggs get released into the soil. And then it's the eggs that hatch in response to the water. And those larval stages then migrate up the plants where they hang out to either be consumed by the host or they penetrate that host. So our two different patterns kind of comes down to what, what is that stage that's going to make that pattern up, up the plant? Is it going to be the adult female or is it going to be a larval stage? Both of them require water. Both of them require, you know, a signal to do that. Um, and that signal is water. Questions? Yep? So the males never go into soil? Nope. The males basically will come out, they'll mate, and then the males end up dying. Okay. Is that nothing? All right. Now, members of this family are actually known to alter host behaviors. They're known to alter host behaviors. So, you know, uh, the canthocephalins are, are known for this. We'll talk about a couple examples of those. Uh, the nematomorphs tend to do the same thing. Well, same thing with the uh, mermithids. All right. So, what sorts of behaviors are altered? Well, it seems like infected individuals seek out water. They seek out water. Uh, why that happens is speculation. However, it's been reported, I think in the 80s or 90s was the first report, is that these infected worms, the, or the infected host, right? the worms are absorbing nutrients from the hemolymph and that could be changing the osmolality of the hemolymph. So, you know, basically your salt, so your salt concentration to the point where it's making the worms think, or making the host think like they're dehydrated. All right. So, you know, if you increase your osmolality, you basically increase your solute concentration in the hemolymph, which could be a trigger or a signal that there's not enough water inside the host. And thus you would see this change in behavior. That's different from, let's say, dicrocelium dendriticum, right? What did dicrocelium do? Yeah, it caused a lockjaw, right? Temperature induced lockjaw on those ants. This one makes, makes the host swim to water. Why is that? Well, a lot of them need water for their life cycle. Right, especially with an aquatic, especially with an aquatic life cycle. So if we go back to uh, Romanomeris culiciforax, right? It needs the insects. It needs that mosquito larva. All right. So to increase your chance that you're going to get there, you all, you change behavior, make them think that they're thirsty. They go out, visit the water, and now our parasite can escape and get to where they need to go. Do we know how they're able to make them think that they go to the water? Uh, yes, but well, it's probably the change of the hemolymph, osmolality. So they're probably changing the concentration in some way. I'd have to dig into that initial paper that, that was suggesting it. And I don't know if they identified what was changing, but that's, that's a predominant theory, and it's lasted for more than a couple decades. So. All right, so that's behavior. But some of these worms also, or some of these parasites, also change the phenotype of that host as a way to increase your transmission. So an example is this, uh, Myrmechanema neotropica. And this is an example. We're not going to go over the life cycle or anything. We, we already have enough life cycles. But this is an example where an infected ant has an abdomen that is now a bright red color, changes its color. It also alters the behavior and encourages the ant to hold up its abdomen kind of up high, up off the leaf. 
Now, why is that? Well, when you do that, it makes it look like it's some sort of berry. All right? And it encourages consumption. It encourages predation on this ant. All right, what's eating them? Birds, for example. Are birds the host? No, birds aren't the host at all. But the eggs can pass right through the digestive system of the birds. Thereby, birds act as dispersers, dispersal agents of these guys. So if you think about why did this evolve, how did it evolve? Right? Perhaps if you can survive through the birds, if you had some trait like this, some modification, just it could have been a mutation that caused this. All right? That worm, all of its offspring, had an increased chance of finding other hosts because of the increased dispersal ability, and thus gradually that trait took over and became fixed in the population. So now that's what we see. Not only phenotype, phenotypic manipulation, but also host behavior manipulation. Pretty crazy. Questions? No? All right, so that was our invertebrates. Let us move to the next one. So our next one, that diversity said vertebrate parasites. Yeah, the vertebrate parasites have been split. Uh, first one we're going to talk about are the stichosome possessors. So uh, these are the parasites, the nematode parasites that have the stichosome. Why do we do them first? Well, because our methods are, and, and our Stein, Steiner nemas, they had stichosomes. All right. After this is the GI tract residing parasites, nematodes. Um, that may actually, I'm, I've been working on that one. I've got two more parasites to kind of finish on that. Uh, and I may break that up into like two different parts. So that way we don't have a big 40, 40 slide presentation. All right. So vertebrate definitive hosts, thousands of species of nematodes utilize vertebrates as their definitive hosts. Probably this is the most common, but the most common life cycle pattern. Utilize a vertebrate as a definitive host. All right, a lot of these life cycles are going to be direct life cycles, one host life cycles, but some of them do utilize intermediate hosts or possibly even paratenic hosts to increase chances of getting to that vertebrate definitive host. So there's a lot of patterns that we're going to see. We're going to break the, the patterns down into three different types. So the first one that we're going to do is stichosome possessors. All right, so with our stichosome possessors, the two species that we're going to talk about is Trichurus trichura, or whipworms, and Trichinella spiralis. All right. Then what we're going to do is talk about these GI tract residents. And, and the GI tract residents actually have quite a few um, parasites. The biggest ones that we're going to talk about are the hookworms, all right, because they, they've been kind of a scourge of humans uh, for a while. And they, they can produce some, some pretty significant pathology. There's several species that we'll talk about. We'll talk about two humans and one dog uh, species. And then we'll talk about Ascaris, two species of those. Uh, Enterobius vermicularis, which are pinworms. And then Camelanus oxycephalus, which isn't a human parasite. But we do have slides because we find it in the fish around here. Uh, and then we will talk about... So, Sickosome possessors, GI tract residents, tend to be direct life cycles. Um, you pick it up either from the eggs or consume the juvenile stage, or in some cases with hookworms, the larval stage penetrates into the host. Tissue dwellers, on the other hand, are going to be using an intermediate host. All right? And there's going to be four of these that we talk about. All right? Three of them are, are human parasites. One of them is a dog parasite. So Dracunculus metanensis. Uh, the guinea worm, Oncocerca volvulus, uh, and Wuccareri bancrofti. Those are the human worms. And then Dirofilari imidis, that's your dog heartworm. So we'll talk about these. I've kind of broken them down. So this presentation is on Trichura strigura and Trichinella spiralis. Ready? Oh, and uh, these are all 
slides that we have in the lab. Uh, except maybe Wukereria. Well, no, Dracunculus and Wukereria, we don't have slides. We have slides of Anca Circle. But Dracunculus and Wukereria, when you see them, you, you'll, I think you'll know why, why we talk about them. All right, so we're going to start with the class, Trichocephalida. All right, Trichocephalida. Key features of this class is the presence of a stichosome, which is a collection of stichocytes that surround our esophagus. Right? The stichocytes are usually arranged in a row, and their function varies depending on what species we're looking at. All right, so the, the stichosome, the stichocytes are typical of this order, as well as in the Myrmithida. All right, so we've already seen these. Now for us, we're going to see these stichocytes in our whipworm. And this was a slide. Well, actually, no, this came from UC Davis. I looked at my slide collection. It was kind of hard. But you can see each of these, that's a stichocyte. They, they look like a pan, pancake-like structures. They're a stack of pancakes. That's their stichocyte. Members of this class also have biopercolate eggs. So they've got eggs that have two operculum. Uh, on them. We have slides of eggs in the lab that you can see this. The one exception <laughs> is Trichinella. So they don't have the biopercolate eggs. So like out of all of the members of this class, right, we're gonna look at only one, or we're looking at two, and one of them doesn't have biopercolate eggs. Right? There's a single gonad in both of the sexes. So males only have one testis, females only have one ovary. And that's different because we said in, in, the, in the nematodes, typically you, you see didelphic pattern where you have two ovaries that converge, or basically when you go to the ovaries, they're at oviduct uterus and then the uterus converges uh, in, into the, the vagina. All right. Our males possess one or no spicules, All right. and they typically lack. Uh, a spicule sheath, I believe. So that's one. Let me double check my notes on that because that's a little unclear. One or no spicules. Two. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. So if they have a spicule, it's, it's surrounded by a spicule sheath. So let's fix this. A little bit more clear. There we go. All right. So they possess one or no spicule and a spicule sheath. So obviously, hopefully, if they don't have a spicule, you'll know that they don't have a spicule sheath at that point. So if they do have that spicule, then it's it's sheath. One thing that they do have, and it's typical of this class, is a bacillary band. A bacillary band is a wide band of pores, of minute pores, on the ventral surface of the esophageal region. All right? So you can kind of think about why this would be the case. Right, well, we've got the stichosome, a collection of all of these glandular cells there. All right? Now, these pores are going to lead to glandular and non-glandular cells. So in the glandular cells, it's thought that these are associated with osmotic and ion regulation inside the worm itself. The non-glandular cells are going to be part of cuticle formation and food storage. So they tend to, uh, yeah, cuticle formation and food storage. All right. Now, we assume that this is their role based on the ultrastructure. So people have gone through here, sectioned them, looked at them under, SE, uh, under uh, transmission electron microscopy, saw structures that resembled other glandular type structures that they know are associated with, uh, uh, let's say, osmotic regulation. And then they assume, well, if they have the same structures, it's probably the same function. But we don't quite know. We don't quite know what, what they're there, but they do have this bacillary band. Are we able to see it? 
We can't see it on our slides. Can't see it on our slides, but basilary bands, that's a, one of the defining features of the trichocephalia. Ready? All right, so species that we're going to talk about is Trichiris trichira, the whip worm. The whip worm. It has tropical and subtropical distribution, so found in warmer areas. Trichiris is found, so all of the Trichiris species, they're found in the large intestines and the cecum of terrestrial mammals. So this is one of those, it's not in the small intestine. Transmission is direct, so no intermediate host or definitive host. It's going to shed the eggs. They can consume them again, or another individual consumes them. Trichiris is called whipworm because of its shape. All right? Because of its shape. The anterior end is going to be very, very slender compared to the posterior end of the worm. Now, it wasn't. They didn't really know anterior posterior when they first found these things. All right, it wasn't until later where they said, "Oh, we had it wrong." So back in the day, they thought the robust part, the south part, was the anterior end, and then you had this really thin tail attached to it. We now know that's not true. The thin part is actually the anterior. So we've got our mouth. You've got your long esophagus with the stichosome associated with it. All right. So why is it called a whip? Well, think about it. You've got the handle, the whip handle, and then you've got the business end of the whip, which is the thin part. All right, so named for its size. And of course, the spruce pets had this wonderful picture. I thought it, it was great. Kind of shows you the size, too. Ready? All right, morphology of whipworm. Buckle capsule is tiny. Very small buccal capsule, but it contains a stylet. So the stylet is likely used for penetration. Penetration of our host tissue. No, I didn't say of the host, I said the host tissue. Our eggs are biopercolate. So I do have a picture down here. Uh, we do, again, we have got slides, so you can, you can clearly see these. But you've got the egg, and then you have these plugs, opercular plugs, on both ends. Now, on a light microscopy, when we look at it, uh, these things kind of, I don't want to say, they refract light. That's the term, refract light. So you'll see it. You'll actually see them. They look like plugs. We have female specimens. Right? That's our slides. And with the females, our vulva is going to be located near the esophagus intestinal junction. So on our worm, this is a male worm, uh, You've got your, your stichosome, your long esophagus, and this, I kind of flipped it. Uh, I don't know if you, you could tell all the words backwards, right? Got it, there, got it, there. it's upside down. I like, I like this one. But anyway, so you got your esophagus, and then you go down here to where you have your intestine. Once you transition from the esophagus to the intestine, that's where we're going to find our vulva. And you're going to see the eggs, you're going to see the, the vagina in there. Uh, you can see the eggs lined up. Our slides, all things, that part's very clear. For the male, we have a single spicule and a spicule sheath. Uh, again, we don't have a slide of it, but if we did, you would see the spicule. The spicule is actually pretty prominent in the male worm. You would clearly see it. You'd have to zoom in to really make out that it's actually sheathed. It's, it's in a structure. And again, I've got these diagrams on the handout, so you can print those out or have them available in lab to help you orient uh, these different structures. Life cycle. Life cycle of trichiris. Let's pull this one out. Move this. Our host is a human. Our host is a human. It's going to be the only host in our lifespan. And 
our adult is going to be found in our large intestine. All right, so we've got Trachuris, Trachura. So our adult is in the large intestine. Right. In the feces, that's where we will find our unembryonated eggs. Our unembryonated eggs. Let's make sure I've got my heights open. Yep. All right, so these eggs are going to be susceptible to desiccation. So it would be best if they were in some sort of moisture, uh, moist, moist environment. What's going to happen? is that these eggs are going to develop outside of the host. The developed eggs. The trigger is probably oxygen. Probably need oxygen in order to develop. So inside of our egg, we will have the J1 develop. That molts to the J2, which then molts to the J3. So our developed egg has a J3 inside of it. That is going to be our infective stage. So we will then consume, accidentally consume, one of these developed eggs. We're still on there. All right. And then the J3 emerges through the opercula and is in the intestine. So, we've got our environment. Um, what type of egg is J3? Okay, it starts with a G. What's that? This? Yeah. Our developed eggs? Oh, okay, sorry. I couldn't, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, the developed, unembryonated eggs, and then we have to get to the egg that has a J3 inside. All right. If we consume a J1 or a J2 or even these unembryonated eggs, that's it. The egg is dead. All right. So we have to get to this J3 stage inside the egg in order for it to be infected. All right. So the J3 hatches in the intestine, small intestine, and then it finds its way down into the large intestine finds its way down into the crypts of the large intestine. What are the name of those crypts? Names of the crypts in the large intestine. Why do you have a completely different thing? Is that just a picture of that? No. Okay, that's me. <laughs> As you think about that, so these things, these J3s, are going to get to the large intestine, go into the crypts of Libraki, which are located in the colon, in the large intestine, and these J3s will penetrate the base of those cells, or at the, at the base of the crypts. Penetrate the cells at the base of the crypts of the cube. So they are now technically in the gut mucosa. So technically they are out of the lumen, they are in the tissue of the large intestine. And then what will happen is that our worm develops. develops to the J4 and to an adult as it migrates back to the surface of the gut epithelium. 
So at this stage, our worms are moving toward, toward the luminal surface. Moving towards the luminal surface. And I don't think that I have it. So if you can imagine it, we've got these crates in the large intestine. RJ3 will get down here to the base, penetrate, get into our gut mucosa, and then they will migrate back towards the luminal surface. And as they do that, they're feeding, maturing, molting, they get to the adult stage. So we are still in the gut mucosa. Still in the gut tissue. At this point now, at this point, now we will have rupturing of our gut mucosa so that the posterior half of the worm will be in the lumen, the anterior half of the worm will be embedded in our gut mucosa. So posterior is in the lumen, the anterior of our worm is embedded in an epithelium, epithelial syncytium. So we had a rupture of our epithelial lining. Now we have our adult posterior in the lumen. The anterior is in an epithelial syncytium. What is an epithelial syncytium? It's a syncytium. What other word is related to syncytium? Syncytium is a noun. What other word sounds similar to syncytium, but maybe a different part of speech? Speech. But we have used it earlier in the course. Syncytial, which is an adjective. What is that? What does that mean? Okay. Multinucleated cells, right? Exactly. Exactly. What we're going to see is that. In this worm, the stickocytes, those glandular cells, are, are forming this epithelial syncytium. And the epithelial syncytium is basically, as the worm's growing and penetrating through these cells, the glandular tissues are causing the cells to form without kind of becoming cells again. So you get all of these cells that have moved through, up at least near the luminal surface, all become one large cell sharing cytoplasm, but all multinucleated. All right, and we're going to see something. The whole function of this epithelial syncytium is that it locks the anterior end of the worm in place because we don't really have holdfasts. All right, we don't have these suckers, we don't have bothria, we don't have any of that. All right, and in these guys, the buccal capsule is really tiny. So if we can leave our anterior end in the, in the epithelial tissue and cause the cells to kind of fuse and form a, more of a syncytium, it locks the worm in place. And this is a bad place to be because the large intestine has a lot of crap that moves through it, right? It has a lot of bulk that moves through it. So our adult post, posterior bursts through the lumen, and then Our individuals are going to mate with other individuals that are close by. So there's no indication. So think about where they go. They have to go to the crypts of Weaver. There's no indication that these J3s are going to penetrate into the 
uh, small intestine, and then migrate to the cryptid liver. No indication of that at all. They have to travel down the gut to get to the large intestine to find these scripts, at which point they then move down. That's important to note because we're going to see a protozoan parasite that doesn't do that. A protozoan parasite gets in the small intestine, gets carried to these scripts, where then we have further development. All right. At, what are other aspects of this life cycle? Number one. These eggs are very susceptible to desiccation. So you're not, you typically don't find whipworms in dry environments. You typically don't find them in dry environments because the eggs can't survive. The other thing, it's down here. In our human whipple, there's a possibility that dogs might be able to serve as a host. Maybe not the perfect host, but just as a suitable host. Something that allows the whipworms to mate, produce eggs. Benefit? It aids in the dispersal. It aids in the dispersal of eggs. If you increase the number of eggs spread out in the environment, it increases our chance of accidentally consuming one of these eggs. All right. So, we ask, what's the definitive host? Humans. What host could serve? Humans. Probably dogs. Questions on the life cycle. All right, so uh, desiccation resistance. Big reason why we don't see it in dry areas. So highest prevalence areas, or the, the areas that have the highest incidence of infection are those warm and moist areas. Why the warm areas? Because uh, development is temperature dependent. So warmer areas, the eggs can develop a little bit more. Uh, and also in these warmer areas, you tend to have humans you know, residing. The other thing that we see with whipworm is, is we tend to see it in those areas that utilize night soil and also exhibit geophagy. All right, so both of these terms, we're going to see them again. What is geophagy? Eating earth, eating dirt. All right, eating dirt. And I'm not talking about the dirt dessert with the gummy worms and, and the crumbled Oreo cookies. I'm talking real life dirt. Are there places that like they'll legitimately make cakes essentially with dirt? Yep. Places that will legitimately make places out of, you know, mud pies, dirt pies. Yep. Yep. Uh, I worked with a girl uh, during my postdoc who I believe her family's from Mississippi. Uh, visited her grandmother's house and she came back and said, yeah, my, my grandmother made a dirt casserole. That's basically what, exactly what it sounds like. Put dirt in a casserole dish and baked it. Why? We can, we can postulate about it when, when we, when we see geophagy again. All right. But what about nights, night soil? But anyways, with the geophagy, if these eggs are in the soil, and you consume the egg, that's how you get infected. Yeah, any of those places that have the geophagy, you tend to see higher incidences of infection. What about the night soil? What do you think that is? Any guesses? Maybe if it's always in the shade? What's that? Maybe if it's always in the shade, so like No, no. You guys know what a bedpan is? Yeah, all right. So uh, you have areas where you're utilizing bedpans. You have to dump that someplace, right? What if you utilize that as fertilizer? 
Or if you use human waste as fertilizer. That is night soil. Why the night soil? Typically the pot gets filled up in the evening at night, <laughs> all right, and then they dump it. And you can also say it's dark, but anyways, uh, yeah, use some night soil uh, as fertilizer, as fertilizer. So now it's not, you're not eating the dirt, but you're contaminating the, the garden. You're, you're contaminating the soils uh, in the areas where you're producing food. So it's possible then that if you don't rinse off your food adequately, you have some eggs on, on the food. All right, uh, we're gonna probably do the pathology uh, on Wednesday, but uh, there is a YouTube video. So I know that some like animal waste is sometimes used as a fertilizer. Uh, obviously the definitive post for this one is humans, but can't you get other parasites by using other animal species as fertilizer? Yep. Yep. Cross-contamination. All right. Here's an endoscopy. What's an endoscopy? Camera in the insides. Yep. Uh, this would probably coming up from, from the back. But this is pretty cool, as we can see our whipworm right there. Uh, this is in the large intestine. This is the back. You can see all of that is gonads. So I, I'm not sure if that's the, the female or uh, the male. Um, ooh, there's another one. We're going to see some. We're running out of time, so I'm going to try to move forward. Here it is. All right. So what they're hitting them, they're irrigating it, hitting it with water. And you can see how it's moving, but it's staying in place. It's not being dislodged. Just trying to find more. Yeah, there's a couple other. There's one. You can see it, it's, it's fluttering. And the reason why it's fluttering is because the book pack half is in the lumen, but the anterior is in that, that epithelial syncytium. So the, the anterior end, that, I bet that's the anterior end of the right there. You can almost make it out. But it, it just moves to where it is. So it's not like a long, the anterior end's not going to be in a long, straight line. It's going to most likely be curved in an irregular pattern forming that epithelial syncytium. And that is, the worm just kind of goes in there. Yep. Now, would they get rid of that with medication, or can yep. they go in and snare it? Uh, medication will kill it. What would happen if they tried to, like, kind of like what they do with polyps, what would happen if they just tried to remove it? Could it get infected if you, like, didn't get it all out instead of partially? No, you'll have, a ho you'll have an immune response to it, because you've just busted the worm, and you're not going to have inflammatory response but yeah drugs can take care of this guy and the drugs will kind of cause them to, to die and then your host immune system will kind of finish out the rest are they usually found in a certain part of the large intestine like that one the system and you filter out no yeah uh well yeah mostly anterior part of the, the large intestine but i believe they can go uh, all the way they can they can extend extend out so yeah, it's, I mean, there's, there's more. You'll see this, this individual. Um, was the individual suffering from, from much? Um, oh, that one was probably female. Let's see if they go back. This one's probably female. The dark lines, those are, I'm sure that's the uterus uh, filled with eggs. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible that the patient went in there for um, GI tract discomfort there. You, See the length of that thing? That's your syncytium right there. Um, yeah, it's possible that they went in for something. It's also possible that this was a, I don't know, a routine endoscopy, if you can call one routine. Um, and they found it. Yeah, they're, they're pretty big. Pretty, pretty good size. So, all right, what we'll do is we'll talk about pathology of uh, whipworm and then. We'll move to Trichinella.
and then this week we'll get into hope. It's no problem. What's that? Oh, I was going to say, I was going to say, and I've never seen a parasite. I don't know if I'll probably react if I did see that. Yeah. I've seen them on I've seen them on college. I've seen them on college. I've seen them on college. Yeah, I've seen all the same. Well, that, that, now you know what to look for. I know. Now we're seeing it, and I'm like, oh, my God.